All right, now recording, we're really ready to start. <laughs> My name is Dakota Wagner. Um, I'm the current chair of the executive board of Forest Hearn, North Carolina. And today we have a wonderful webinar for you all, all about pollinators. And I'm gonna wait just about a few more seconds because we had over 300 people registered today. So I do wanna give some time for those folks to roll in and get settled. Before we get started, I do want to say um, we are in Zoom meeting format, which means that we have both microphone and video capabilities of all of our participants. While we're in our presentation mode, if everyone could please keep your microphones on mute so that we could give the entire floor to our awesome speakers that we have today, that would be really great, really appreciated. And then we will have a Q&A session at the end. And at that point, um, there are several different ways to ask those questions, and I believe Colby will go over those in a second. Um, all right, I've seen people rolling in have kind of slowed down, so I will move my slide forward and just talk about the agenda for today. So like I said, this webinar is all about pollinators. It is part one in a three-part series of our 2023 programming. We're really excited this year to focus on pollinators, as it says here, and the different parts of pollinators and their interactions within our landscape and forests, and looking at what pollinators are, what they do, and how we could best be stewards of our land to also be stewards of our pollinators. So today we'll get started. Um, my, again, my name is Dakota. I'll be your host and moderator today. And then we're gonna have some Zoom housekeeping um, with Colby. And then we'll get started with our speakers. Um, we have Debbie Roos is going to kick us off. She's with um, NC Cooperative Extension. And then we'll have a next uh, presentation specifically about the role of caterpillars uh, with Mike Dunn, who is a naturalist educator. Two really awesome speakers who have a lot to say. Um, so I am going to stop talking and hand it off to Colby um, to do some Zoom housekeeping. All right, thanks Dakota. Um, just to let you know, there will be a, a five minute question and answer session, an answer session after each present presenter and also a long at the end of the webinar. Um, you can ask your questions. Um, you can ask your questions by just in an answer um, button at the bottom of your page. Um, or if you want to wait, or if you want to wait and ask it live, uh, just make sure you read at the end of the session session and you can do that by clicking you can do that by clicking on the re button down at the bottom of the zoom window and and raising your hand uh, we do have some poll questions some poll questions that will talks and just remind you all to, to take the time take the time to respond to those and they are uh, launched and we are recording this session we are recording this session and the session will be available after the after the webinar is through. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Colby. So I will now hand it off to Debbie. That will stop sharing my screen so she can get her shared and we can get started. We can take a moment to say hello to all the wonderful faces joining us today. Debbie, how's it going? All right, while we're waiting on that, um, I'd really like to know um, who's joining us today. So maybe in the chat box, if you could put your name and where you're sitting right now, and perhaps something that you're really excited about for spring. I know it started early. I'm in the mountains of North Carolina, and February was really nice and beautiful, and things started to bloom but we hit some really cold weather. Oh, awesome. All right, <laughs> Debbie, it, you're all good. It happens. All right. I don't know I, what was going on there. Does the screen look okay, Dakota? Yes, it looks great. All right. Hey, everybody, really excited to be here with y'all today to talk about one of my very favorite topics. So um, as Dakota mentioned, we're going to have about three webinars on this topic. So for now, we're sticking to spring. 
And what I would um, like to cover in this webinar, I'm gonna give you a brief intro to my Pollinator Paradise demo garden because I'm gonna be referring to it throughout the presentation. And um, uh, that gives you a good reference and that's where I gain all my experience. I'm gonna talk about pollinator diversity, uh, the role of pollinators in the ecosystem. And uh, we're gonna look at spring blooms and spring chores for pollinators and I'll finish up with resources. So uh, the Pollinator Paradise Garden uh, created as a demonstration garden in Pittsburgh in 2008. And the idea for that was to provide a teaching tool for me. I do um, tours and workshops from it, lots of activity and engagement on social media. Um, so I invite all of you to come visit. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, it's expanded over the years. So this is the garden's 15th year. Uh, we now have over 225 species in the garden and 85% of them are native to North Carolina. And I manage it organically with a really awesome group of volunteers. Most of the photos I'm gonna show uh, in this presentation, I took in the garden unless you see uh, a, an occasional photo credited to someone else. So we're gonna start out looking at pollinator diversity and look at the primary cast of characters that we consider to be pollinators in uh, North Carolina. So let's look first at the butterflies, moths, and skippers. We have a lot of diversity here. We have about 177 species of butterflies and skippers in North Carolina and over 2,700 species of moths. So um, we've got a lot of diversity there. And this is basically a quick photo tour to give you an idea of that diversity from some of our small uh, banded hair streaks. Uh, the Cecropia caterpillar, one of my very favorites. This is North Carolina's second largest caterpillar. Um, it's just beautiful. I've had kids tell me it looks like it has ladybugs attached to it. And here um, I was able to get a picture of a, an adult moth that had just emerged from its cocoon. Um, sometimes you'll see the cocoons on shrubs. They're kind of large, like gosh, bigger than a golf ball covered in leaves. And then the photo on the bottom, I dissected the inside of the cocoon. It's got an inner chamber with the uh, actual pupa. Um, of course, y'all are familiar with the Eastern Tiger Swallowtails. I've already been seeing them for a few weeks here in the Piedmont region anyway. Um, we've got some hummingbird moths, like our clear wing moths. Um, they, they can mimic hummingbirds in their flight. Some the different species, some are the size of bumblebees. Um, I was very excited last year to finally meet my first giant swallowtail butterfly. I knew we had them in the state because I would occasionally have, um, I mean, I knew we had them in the county because I would occasionally have people send me pictures and say, what is this? And last year, a friend of mine uh, said exactly that. What is this? Because these, these weird, in her words, snake looking larvae were consuming her Meyer lemon tree. She wasn't really excited about that. So I came and um, relocated them to another friend's place nearby who had the host plant, one of the host plants for um, what, what are also called orange dogs, the caterpillars, um, the trifoliate orange. But this is the beautiful giant swallowtail. It's the largest butterfly in the U.S. So hopefully y'all will see that. It's actually found throughout the state, not in every county, but in each region. Uh, another small butterfly would be the juniper hair streak. And I love the, love seeing the long-tailed skippers in the um, early fall. Um, they're just gorgeous with their turquoise coloration. One of our tiniest butterflies would be the Eastern tail blue. And this one's uh, apparently patiently waiting for these milkweed blooms to open. Um, of course, the monarchs, um, I, I pretty much like clockwork, start seeing my first monarch butterfly around tax day on April 15th. And then right after that, start finding the eggs, you know, on the very newly sprouting milkweed. We always hope that those sync up, that they have milkweed plants when they first arrive. Uh, the American snout butterfly can be very well camouflaged and look like a, a dead leaf when it wants to, when it hides that orange coloration on its underwing. Um, I don't see a lot of luna moths in the garden, but I found this one on perched on a um, coneflower plant. One of our most common skippers is the silver spotted skipper. This one's on a fall blooming liatris. And our largest caterpillar in North Carolina is the hickory horn devil, which is the larva of the regal moth. 
And when it's fully grown, it's actually the size of a hot dog. So <laughs> keep your eye out for those. It's something to behold. They look kind of scary, but um, they're, they're not, um, they don't sting and not, not venomous. Um, they just kind of have these crazy appendages to ward off, you know, predators like birds. Uh, here's a, scout, a clouded skipper on um, climbing aster and one of my all-time favorite uh, caterpillars, um, the spice fish swallowtail, which likes to uh, spin some silk and fold over the leaves to kind of hide out uh, during the day. This is a very newly hatched pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar, and it's heading towards the eggs because they'll often eat the eggs that they uh, just hatched from as their first meal for a little bit of protein. So that's kind of a good, uh, uh, just a quick overview of only a handful of our butterflies, moths, and skippers. Now we're going to look at wasp and um. I'm always trying to convince people that wasps aren't just terrible things. Most people love to hate them, it seems like, because they have not so fond memories of, you know, being chased down by yellow jackets. But in fact, um, you know, most of our wasps are solitary. We have almost 2,100 species of predatory wasps in North America. And of this 2,100 species, a little bit less than 2,100, only about 20 species of these are social wasps, like yellow jackets and hornets and paper wasps. And these are the ones that are going to that are going to be defensive of their nest. And if you approach the nest, you're going to find yourself in trouble. All the rest of the wasps are solitary, so they're just going about their day collecting insects to uh, feed their young. Um, here's a katydid wasp, and you can see why they can be considered pollinators because as they're they will also consume nectar and pollen, but uh, primarily they're they're uh, provisioning their nest with um, depending on the species of wasp you know, different types of insects. This one kind of gives it away as to what they search for, but some prey on spiders, some on caterpillars, uh, stink bugs, um, all kinds of things, um, you know, just all kinds of insects, depending on what type of wasp it is. This one's on a yellow passion flower. These are some thread-waisted wasps doing a little multitasking on mountain mint. This scolion wasp is actually a parasitoid of, um, uh, be beetle grubs in the soil, so they'll dig down and, and search for beetle grubs and lay their egg on them. I always love seeing the potter wasp, and I especially love finding their little clay pot nest. As you can see, this one is uh, kind of hidden under a leaf of a New Jersey tea shrub, and they just they, they create and fashion these beautiful little um, nests that they provision with caterpillars and lay an egg on it, and, and so that makes a really nice place for the uh, larvae to develop. Uh, one of our social wasps, of course, would be the paper wasp, which are just beautiful coloration. Um, and they will, uh, this one is actually um, tearing apart a black swallowtail caterpillar that it will take back to the nest to feed the, the young. And kind of just for fun, I wanted to show you this one. This is not considered a pollinating wasp, but this is, um, and if we had more time, I would ask for comments on this, but we don't. <laughs> so um, this is actually a monarch butterfly egg on a milkweed stem. And I blew it up a little here. The little orange thing is a tiny, tiny, tiny egg parasitoid called a trichogramma wasp. And so they actually lay their eggs on another insect's eggs. Uh, in this case, uh, monarch. Um, I, I have a lot of growers that I work with that um, actually release these wasps in their greenhouse to help control tomato fruit worm and, and horn worms and things like that. So they're very effective. They're not considered pollinators. I kind of put it in there for fun, but just to show you, there's so many tiny things out there that go unseen to us. Um, and, and when it parasitizes that egg, it turns black. So sometimes you may notice a black egg, but not know, not know what caused it. And now let's look at some of our beetles. Um, there's a lot of beetles out there. One third of all animals are beetles or about 40% of insects in the world are beetles. So there's many different species. Uh, there's of course some ladybird beetles on um, Golden Alexander. We have some of these beautiful uh, longhorn beetles with their very long antennae. Um, and then the soldier beetles, you often see them especially congregating on flowers in the fall. Um, they they are, will consume pollen. Um, but they also are predators as are lady beetles. So they'll eat soft bodied insects and their, their larvae will eat grasshopper eggs in the soil. This is a beautiful kind of um, quirky looking beetle, I think, um, uh, with, a, with a crazy antennae. Um, this is on wild quinine, but I just think it's a beautiful beetle. And you know, some of these beetles are, are herbivorous. They're gonna be plant pests, if you will, but they're part of the food web like this um, milkweed leaf beetle. 
um, which would, would certainly eat uh, milkweed, but I don't, I don't worry about it. I don't consider it a problem. Um, and then our scarab beetle on micro, um, Piedmont barber's buttons. Here's another, uh, you know, leaf feeding beetle like the uh, feeds on obviously passion flower, excuse me, passion flower. And then we have flies. Let's look at a few of the flies that can be important pollinators, especially the surfid flies. Um, some of these are bee and wasp mimics. This is a yellow jacket hoverfly, and it's actually dwarfing the sweat bee in that photo. Um, these are pollinators as adults, but their larvae are actually aphid predators, so they could be really important in helping to control aphid populations. And the adults will actually lay their eggs among an aphid colony on a leaf. Uh, just showing you the diversity, these are also surfid flies, but a much smaller species. And then we have some of our parasitic flies, like tachinid flies, which will lay their egg on, on other insects, and then that insect will hatch and consume that one. And then we have one of my favorite groups of flies, the robber flies. These are aerial predators. I love watching them. They are so fast. You can see with their large eyes that they're effective predators and they snatch things out of the air or, you know, usually um, I've seen them just, I've seen, they like to perch on leaves and then kind of survey the domain and then they'll, they'll take off and catch something and be back within like two seconds <laughs> with a honeybee or something. This one's actually called a bee panther and they're quite large um, and they can, uh, they've been, I've, I've, they've been noted in the literature to be able to catch hummingbirds. Um, and just kind of showing you, and I had to sneak in a picture of one of my favorite critters, the green link spider, but these are two amazing predators. And I can tell you when they go head to head, it is always the green link spider that comes out ahead because I have several pictures that I've taken over the years of the spider devouring the, um, the robber fly. So then we're gonna uh, zero in on the bees. So um, bees, um, we've got lots and lots of different species of bees in North Carolina, over 560 species just in our state. About 75% of these uh, native bees are solitary and, um, and also about 65% are nest ground nesting and 35% are cavity nesting. So that'll have, that's gonna pop up later in this talk, that'll have repercussions. Uh, bumblebees um, are considered cavity nesters. They often um, nest in the ground, but they're not digging space in the ground. They're occupying existing cavities and they can um, be very opportunistic. So sometimes we're surprised at where we might find them. I've had several people tell me they found a bumblebee nest in their bluebird houses. <laughs> so that could be interesting. Um, I took this picture at a friend's barn. She uh, had a, a cat bed on top of a table in a barn and she described it as a moving ball of fur. She didn't know what it was. And I'd never seen bumblebees collect animal hair um, and dried grasses to make a nest. So that was very interesting. But speaking of grasses, bumblebees often like to nest in the cavities formed by these bunch grasses like little blue stem. So those can be great for nesting habitat. And then we have leaf cutter bees. Um, so like they, if you, if you ever go out into your landscape and it looks like somebody took a hole punch to your leaves, you know that you have leaf cutter bees that are active in the area, which always makes me happy. And they cut sections of the leaves out and then take them back and line the nest with them. And then we have our ground nesting bees. These are very active right now. Um, and they tend to freak people out when they don't know what they are. Um, I get lots of calls about them. Usually people want to kill them. I've had lots of people tell me they're pouring gasoline down the halls with just whew, trying to prevent that from happening. But um, these are, um, there's many different species of ground nesting bees. Um, th this species here, I took this picture at the Chapel Hill Library and they had people freaking out about it and they called and um, this is actually a great, until they learned what they were and they were okay with it because they're not a stinging threat to people. Uh, they often like this kind of site that's sloping, well-drained, very sparsely, um, you know, uh, vegetated, just got thin grass on it. So, um, and this, the, there's the female bee on the right, the, the, the andrenid bee, and she'll spend her day, um, usually starting early to mid-March, going out and um, finding pollen. And she's dug some tunnels underground, excavated the soil, and dug the tunnels and she provisions them with uh, pollen balls and lays an egg on it. Um, so this is in March 10th, about a month later, it looks like this. So the female by that time has died. She's done her job. She's left her, her babies with lots of food and uh, the rain washes away the little you know excavated mounds and all the activity is happening underground and the bees develop throughout the year. 
Another species of um, ground nesting bee, this is a little later in the year in May, uh, are chimney bees. This is Anthophora abrupta. They make these little turret-like, uh, uh, you know, things above the nest entrance. Um, and here's a female provisioning her nest with the male. The males will hover over the nest entrance waiting to mate with the females. So it turns out that bees are really our best pollinators. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but um, one is um, a lot of our native species will tend to be very active um, and when it's cold and wet and not a lot of light versus our, our non-native honeybees, which they have no incentive to leave the, the hive when it's cold and wet. Be why? Because they have all these honey stores that they've collected. They can store months worth of honey. So uh, they, don't, they don't tend to do that. Also, some of our native species like bumblebees can practice, uh, are capable of buzz pollinating or sonicating a flower. And there's a, you know, a certain percentage of flowers out there that require that. Honeybees are not capable of doing that, um, but they have these porcidal anthers that, that have to be buzz pollinated to release the pollen. So native bees are great, great at that, some of them. But the main reason that bees are considered to be our most effective pollinators is because they are the only critter out there that's deliberately collecting pollen and moving through the landscape, um, you know, transferring it all over and then carrying it back to the nest. All the other critters that I showed you as through that slideshow, yes, they're getting pollen on them when they visit a flower, but it's accidental. They're not going there to seek the pollen usually, unless they're gonna eat a little bit at the time. So that's why bees are considered the most important pollinator. Um, and native bees on a bee per bee basis tend to be more effective pollinators um, than honeybees for those reasons I just stated, but there's a lot of diversity out there. Remember I said, you know, 560 plus species and different color and shape and size and different tongue lengths and all that determines what kind of flower that they can um, you know, access. So of course our honeybee, as I mentioned, is a very important pollinator, very important for producing honey crops, important economically to us, not a native bee. Um, and then some of our native bees would be like the squash bee, which is a ground nesting bee. They often nest right at the base of the squash plants and uh, often the males spend the night in the flowers. Our southeastern blueberry bee is one of our many important blueberry pollinators. We have between 17 and 20 species of bumblebees, depending on who you ask, just in North Carolina. Um, and so, and I'm really excited, we're getting ready to start a southeastern bumblebee atlas. So you'll hear more about that later. Um, but here's another, and you can see that big clump of pollen in this pollen basket on this bee that she's gonna carry back to the nest. Uh, remember that picture I showed you of the ground nesting mining bees at the library? This is the uh, bee here, completely covered in pollen from antennae to eyeballs to head, thorax, legs, everything. This is on uh, Viburnum nudum. Here's another shot of that same mining bee, same species of bee uh, collecting pollen and nectar from Golden Alexander. One of my favorite uh, spring pollinators and um, the primary pollinator along with bumblebees of wild indigo or baptisia is the leafcutter bee. Some people have said these resemble flying Cheetos when they get covered in pollen. Notice how she's got all the pollen on the underside of her abdomen. That's because this particular group of bees, the, the scopa, which are the branched hairs that carry the pollen, they're all found on the underside of her abdomen. Um, another, another really striking um, native bee, which is almost all black, is the two-spotted longhorn bee with the long antennae. Um, and I love the sweat bees. They come in beautiful metallic blues and greens or like little flying emeralds around the garden. A lot of our native bees are specialists, which means they only collect pollen from a limited species, sometimes one if they're monolectic or, or um, oligolectic bees like this hibiscus bee. That means they collect pollen from um, flowers and related uh, to the hibiscus, for example. Um, and so that's important. Um, and then this is, um, if, if any of y'all are birders, you may be familiar with the cuckoo bird. Well, the cuckoo leafcutter bee is kind of a similar uh, behavior. Uh, the female has this pointed abdomen and she locates the nest of the um, uh, leafcutter bee, eject, pokes through it with her pointed abdomen, ejects the eggs and replaces them with her own. And that means she doesn't even have to collect pollen because the other the other bee has already done it. And she doesn't even have a way to collect pollen. She doesn't have the branched hair. So that's very interesting. Uh, I love the sunflower bee. It's a very chunky bee with these big old um, pollen laden legs. 
Um, everybody loves to hate carpenter bees, but in fact, they're really important pollinators. Um, and if you ever see them with this uh, pollen coated thorax, you know that you have passion flower in your area because that's when they're nectaring like this, they're, they're the perfect size to uh, scrape their thorax under the uh, anther there and get coated in uh, pollen. Um, here's another leaf cutter bee, which is called a carpenter mimic. This is the male. And there you see the female again with her um, scopa covered in pollen. This is on uh, Joe Pie weed. So I'm gonna ask one of the poll questions. Um, what is the primary reason that bees are the best pollinators? Is it because some bees are active in inclement weather? Is it because some are able to buzz pollinate flowers? Or is it because they can deliberately collect pollen to bring back to the nest? Or because they exhibit a wide diversity in size, shape, and tongue length? And if someone can launch that poll, that would be great. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I can see, is it still, you can keep it open. I see right now we've got 63% um, saying because they deliberately collect pollen, 32% because they exhibit a wide diversity in size and shape, 4% because they're active in inclement weather, and 3% because they're able to buzz pollinate. Um, Y'all did great. Um, in fact, all those things are true, but the 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 main reason, which was the question, the main reason that they're the best pollinators is because they deliberately collect pollen. But don't feel bad if you didn't get it because all of those statements are true. <laughs> so, okay, so now we're gonna move on to um, birds and bats. Um, uh, hummingbirds are actually um, great uh, pollinators. Actually, of all our birds, it's really, um, the hummingbird is the only pollinator. There's about 8,000 plants in North and South America that depend on hummingbirds pollination services. I rarely seem to get photographs of them because every time I see them, I never have my camera, but I got a couple. There's one on obedient plant here. Um, here's one on the uh, cardinal flower. I just love seeing them. And then of course we have our bats. We have uh, nectivorous or nectar feeding bats um, like you find in uh, the American Southwest and tropical areas. And those are the pollinating bats because they're seeking nectar. They're getting right up there in the flower. But in North Carolina, we have about 16 species of bats and our bats are, ne are insectivorous, eating insects. So they're not considered pollinators. However, they're very important you know, for pest control services. Um, so so uh, we do love our bats. They're just not considered pollinators in uh, North Carolina, at least. The role of pollinators in our ecosystem. So more than 85% of our flowering plants require an animal. And most of those animals are insects to move pollen. Um, you probably heard that every third bite of food that goes to your mouth uh, requires a pollinator. Again, primarily insects, primarily bees. And then we have in the natural ecosystem, we have uh, wildlife is, is, is very much dependent on the services of pollinators because they're eating. Uh, what, are, what, what is wildlife eating? They're eating the fruits and nuts and seeds that result from animal pollination. And a lot of them are eating the actual pollinators themselves. And they're a very vital part of the food web. Um, about 96% of our terrestrial birds uh, feed insects to their young, primarily uh, caterpillars. And that's gonna be the focus of Mike's talk, which I can't wait to hear. When I'm in the pollinator garden, um, I just love, I get so happy when I see the birds enjoying you know, the seeds. That's why we don't cut things back when they're done seeding. Uh, we see lots of goldfinches and things like mockingbirds feeding on uh, berries. And, uh, you know, again, um, some of these other critters are eating my beloved pollinators, like the green link spider feeding on this bumblebee, but I'm okay with that because it's all part of the food web. And here's an example of a Carolina anole who loves hanging out on the blooms uh, to, to, to take advantage of all those pollinators that it attracts, but everybody's got to eat. Okay, so now we're going to change uh, gears a little bit. We're going to look at some of the spring blooms for pollinators. So um, where you're gonna find these spring blooms in various areas, they could be woodlands and natural areas, roadsides, they could be uh, farms, I work with farmers, they could be your own garden or your neighbor's gardens that have cover crops and weeds like you see here, that bottom picture I took at a local farm with a beautiful uh, crimson clover cover crop. 
that they use for their organic farming. Um, but even weeds like uh, dead nettle and dandelion can be very important um, sources of nutrition for pollinators. You know, all the red buds are blooming now um, and, and other, other pussy willow, things like that are all very important. Since I only have half an hour for this entire talk, I'm just going to focus kind of on the, the, the native perennial, mostly native perennials that we would have in our landscape. So I'm going to look at some of, we're going to look at some of my favorite spring blooming perennials. And these are plants that are real workhorse plants. So that means that they provide benefits even when they're not blooming. So at least three seasons, if not four seasons out of the year. Um, and I've got lots of information about all of these on my website. Uh, Downy wood mint, Blophilia ciliata, is great combined with the butterfly weed and it attracts lots of different pollinators. Um, the bumblebees and honeybees love it. I have several species of pinstamen or beard tongue. Uh, you can see two different bees at the same time vying for flowers here. This is the uh, Pinstamen digitalis, and I've got other species like the Smalls beard tongue you see here. One of my all-time favorites in the spring is the wild indigo. I'm really excited. I'm watching all the little, you know, clumps are emerging now. These are the ones that look like asparagus when they come out of the ground. Uh, I've got several species of that. This is the Baptisia alba, the white one, and they, the, the only two, um, pollinators I have ever seen on Baptisia are bumblebees and leafcutter bees, but they're very important to that. And this is again, a three season plant. Amsonia or blue star is a great one. Uh, this is a four season plant, offers benefits throughout the entire year. It's got this beautiful star shaped bloom. This is a little leafcutter bee foraging on it. Uh, Golden Alexander uh, primarily blooms in the spring. It's already blooming. Um, this is a mining bee enjoying it. And the neat thing about it is it's also the native host plant for the black swallowtail caterpillar, which you usually only see on the dill, parsley, fennel, all those non-natives. Uh, purple coneflower um, blooms in the spring, but it actually will go all the way through the fall. This is an American lady butterfly. Several of our milkweed species start blooming in the spring. I've got about 10 native species of milkweed in my garden. So a little bit later, I love this red ring milkweed and um, the purple milkweed. The lance leaf blanket flower will bloom all the way into the fall if you keep it deadheaded. Um, and then the Stokes aster is nice. Here's a leaf cutter bee enjoying that. This is a nice uh, evergreen um, plant. Lots of different species of bee balm that I have in the garden. Some like part shade, some like sun. Um, here it is kind of in a mixed planting. This is one of my favorite species called Monarda clinopodia. This is the basil bee balm or white bee balm. A really nice um, deciduous shrub is a New Jersey tea that's a late spring bloomer. Um, and then here's a close up of the bloom. So that's really nice. And then I just want to show you a few snapshots from the garden, kind of a quick uh, virtual tour. Um, while we're going through this. So I'm going to send you links, as I mentioned uh, later. I think I already said that. And um, I, uh, my face, I have Facebook albums that are devoted to the garden. So uh, every picture in the Facebook album is uh, the plant and the insect is identified. So it's a great way to learn about different plants and critters. But these are all spring shots that we'll see between now and, you know, late May, early June. Ooh, look at that Baptisia. I'm really excited. I got native thistle in the garden. Thistle gets a bad rap because most people think of the noxious weed on the roadside. Since no known local nurseries offered native thistle, I had to direct seed that one, but it's become a real favorite. This is a green milkweed, purple milkweed, <laughs> a little leaf cutter bee. So I was a kid that had pet snakes. So I just love all the critters. I love all the reptiles in the garden. This is gonna be very soon. This is the possum haw Alex decidua and it's a really great um, source for the mining bees that emerge very early. The columbines are just starting to bloom. Most of them are not quite blooming, but I've seen a few. That's a great hummingbird plant. The garden is open 24 seven to visitors. Here's some nice spring. That's the Amelanchia and a dwarf, dwarf witch alder, Father Gilla. Okay, so now we're changing focus yet again. <laughs> I told you I had a lot to cover. Let's look at spring chores. What are what would you be doing now for pollinators if you were uh, planting for pollinators? So these are the kind of things we're going to look at. We're going to talk about cutting plants back or removing spreaders. We're going to look at all these different things in a little bit more detail. 
So probably one of the most important things we're doing right now is we're cutting back our perennials and native grasses. So hopefully you've left them through the winter. Um, you know, I, had a, I have an article on my website about fall chores and the, the main message is leave the leaves and save the stems. I'm sure y'all have heard at least one of those sayings, leave the leaves. So we, we don't wanna cut everything back in the fall when things die back because we want to preserve that, um, the seed for birds. We wanna preserve the shelter for all my favorite spiders and critters that are hiding out in the plant canopy. And just aesthetically, I'd much rather look at, you know, beautiful dried things than nothing, a barren landscape. So now is the best time to cut back between late February into March. Sometimes we go into April. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you why, because remember when I was talking about 35% uh, of our native bees are cavity nesting. That's about 200 species in North Carolina, by the way. Well, one of their favorite cavities happen to be stems. So um, they're either looking, we've either got hollow stems or pithy stems. So pithy stems are soft, but can be hollowed out by certain species of bees. There's only a handful of bees that are capable of doing that. So, and that's the carpenter bee, the some leaf cutter bees and uh, small resin bees. All the other bees have to have the stem already hollowed. So that could be a stem that's naturally broken off or ones that we cut for them. And, and I will say, I used to erect those bee hotels, you know, with all the little tubes in them. I don't do that anymore. Some people like doing that. I would much rather provide this, the stems naturally through the landscape. So I've been documenting um, which stems are hollow and which are pithy. So that's been really interesting. Um, so just a kind of a um, you know, quick thing, but this includes species like um, uh, Hyssop and Golden Alexander, Rattlesnake Master, all kinds of, I don't wanna name them all, we don't have time, but these are some examples of some of our hollow stems. By the way, the one on the bottom left is Panicum or switchgrass. So um, the thing is, the, as I mentioned, these native bees come in all sizes. Some are so tiny, you can barely see them. And so they want um, all different stem diameters. You know, some species want the bigger ones and some want the smaller ones. So it's good to have that diversity of diameters there. And then here's some example of some of your pithy stems uh, that have to, that are soft enough that a bee with the right mouth parts could hollow it out. Um, and so, so the, as I, I think I kind of mentioned the life cycle, what we're talking about here is the female, these cavity nesting or stem nesting bees, they emerge in the spring now and a little bit later. They start immediately looking for appropriate nesting places like stems. They collect the pollen, they put it in a ball, they put it down into the stem, they lay an egg on it, and then they're done. And um, often they'll cap it with a little bit of mud or something. And then those larvae eat the pollen and develop throughout the whole year and they overwinter in that cavity, and then they emerge the following spring. Now, each species has its own timetable. Some emerge, the earliest emerging bees are the mason bees, which are already emerging. Uh, and some don't emerge till, till later in the spring, even into May or later. So uh, because the earliest emerging bees come out now in March, in early March, I try to have at least some stems cut back by then, um, you know, if I can. But just some examples. Uh, the blue orchard bee on the left, this one's foraging on uh, fern leaf phacelia. Um, but here's some examples of those uh, stem nesting bees. Okay, and so I don't know how well you can tell this on Zoom. Um, that picture there is of, I just took it, and it's showing a stand of Coreopsis triptyris, the tall tick seed. And if you look closely, again, I don't know how this translates to Zoom, looks good to hear. <laughs> um, I can see both the stems that we cut last spring coupled with the kind of redder stems of last year's growth that we're just about to cut right now. So, so those are still the, stem, the stems that were cut last year. That's the ones where I would hope some bees are gonna emerge from any day now. And then we're gonna cut the other ones back now. That's for bees that are gonna be nesting this year. So we typically advise to cut plants back anywhere between eight to 24 inches, depending, you know, the taller species, I tend to cut them back higher. Here's an example. So this is a uh, Oryngium yuccifolium, rattlesnake master, one of our natives. So this is on the left, shows what it looks like now, could look like that right now. And then we cut it back, we cut the stems back to, you know, one and a half, two feet. And the other thing is cleaning, you can see that cleaning up those dead leaves gets sunlight down to that nice green new growth, right? Which was previously shaded by all those old leaves. 
And then you can see the beautiful hollow stems of uh, Rattlesnake Master, okay? So then another big activity, one, another time consuming activity in the spring can be removing uh, spreading plants because uh, a lot of our plants, even natives, um, uh, are, can be very aggressive and take over a garden. I have a whole list of them. <laughs> this is just a fraction of them. And I actually took this picture yesterday. This has three of the main culprits right in one shot. Uh, in the back, the kind of grassy looking thing, that spider ward. Uh, the main plant there is a poppy mallow, which is a Midwestern native. And then kind of in the middle is the golden Alexander, a North Carolina native. And they all three of them will spread, spread, spread. And we have to divide them, which means digging them out. And I just give them to my volunteers and sometimes plant them in another part of the garden. So that's a big part. Now, a lot of people like to plant in the spring. I like to plant primarily in the fall. That's the best time. Um, but um, I do a little bit of planting in the uh in the spring, it's generally just kind of replacement planting or a little bit of fill-in planting here and there. The challenge is, you know, it looks kind of bare out there now, right? And it's, we always struggle this time of year to remember, oh, that little, that little aster there that looks maybe like mm, a foot in diameter, a couple of inches high <laughs> now as it's emerging, wow, it's going to be four feet wide and three feet high in a couple of months. So you got to remember that when you're planting, because often you end up planting things too close to it and they completely get shaded out. Um, another big activity in the spring is pruning. Um, I we This picture of the pictures up top was this week. Uh, I pruned back the woody climbing aster vine. So that shows this is on a trellis is on the other side of this brick wall. Um, and now the, uh, there's the after picture. So this is a very vigorous vine. We cut it back hard two or three times in the spring. Now, and then we don't touch it after that because of course it'll be forming its flower buds. Now, I generally do not prune my shrubs. I don't want to give people the wrong idea. Very, I do very little pruning. Occasionally, I will do what I call regenerative pruning on, on some shrubs that have gotten too leggy or too big. And, and like literally, this is an American beauty berry. I've only done this one time in 15 years, but it, it responded great. Uh, I cut it all the way to the ground. And then the, the picture on and, and about this time of year, about early to mid-March. And then the picture on the right is a couple of months later with that new growth. So again, always research the species you want to cut back because it will kill some species if you cut them to the ground. So don't get mad at me. Make sure you <laughs> Debbie said that you can cut some back. Well, sure, it depends on the species. I've done it with um button bush and beautyberry and um clethra or sweet pepper bush. Again, not often done, just occasionally can really rejuvenate a plant. Uh, there's always weeding to do year round. Now you may recall, I mentioned how some of these weeds can benefit pollinators and, and I, I absolutely leave them in my quote unquote lawn at home. I don't like to leave them in the pollinator garden because they will outcompete my perennials, even if they do benefit pollinators. I just took this picture yesterday. So this is a, a poor little cone flower coming up, completely surrounded by dead nettle. And um, so I do want to remove that dead nettle because I really want the coneflower. Even though the dead nettle can benefit pollinators, I don't want it in my pollinator garden. I want it in my lawn. <laughs> so hopefully that makes sense. Here's the chickweed. Loves to get out of control. A lot of these weeds are edible um, it, to people and to chickens. So, you know, a lot of times when we remove them, people are bringing them home to their chickens or um, eating them themselves. So that, has, that chickweed needs to get gone there because it's interfering with the native perennials that want to pop up. But again, this is the, just showing that um, these weeds like Creeping Charlie can benefit pollinators. There you go. Mulching can be somewhat controversial. I wish I had more time to go in that. A lot of people say don't mulch because it interferes with ground nesting bees, which is true. I could not um, have my pollinator garden without mulch. So I, I try to you know, do the best I can. And the reason I say that, a lot of my garden, as you can see here, is surrounded by parking lot uh, asphalt and concrete, and it's a heavy clay soil. So I just, with the heat and the lack of moisture, I can't do it without mulch. And it was a really, really crappy soil and adding mulch every year that decomposes an organic matter has really improved the soil. So I think you can find a happy medium. The way I get around it is I, I, I try to use less and less mulch every year. And maybe you can only mulch kind of the, the edge of the beds because the other part will fill in with the plants and you won't see it anyway. And that'll leave some of it bare. And also I do, I do make sure and leave some areas bare 
and I've even created ground nesting bee habitat where we uh, removed all the mulch and plants and put down these rocks because bees like to nest among rocks. So that's the one way I try to do that. Uh, the other fun thing, uh, for the first time this year, um, I built a, we built a couple of rock piles last month. Uh, rock piles can be really great habitat features for wildlife. Um, they attract a lot of different species of beneficial insects and reptiles. They can, I'm hoping to attract things like bumblebees that might want to nest in there, uh, leafcutter bees, those chimney bees. I put it as a spring chore. It can be done year round. I would, I would recommend doing it in their cool season because it ain't easy hauling rocks. <laughs> but just to, and I'm, I'm going to be doing an article on this, but this is kind of showing you my process. Um, you know, I, um, you don't have to dig a pit. We did it because a pit allows for critters to get cooler in the summer if they want to go down there and warmer in the winter. Um, I found miscellaneous things around my house that had cavities like uh, old terracotta pots bricks with holes in them of various sizes. I use cinder blocks. I use um, these masonry, you know, things. Um, the idea is to create some cavities, a little apartment down in the basement there, um, and also to create openings to the outside. So um, you see the bottom, how we kind of lined it with all these things. And then here we are on the far right, starting to cover it with rocks. And just the piling of the rocks, of course, creates cavities in itself. And then this is showing we got to still cover that center block and that's the finished product. I'm going to hurry. Okay, um, uh, praying mantis. Another chore we do is we remove praying mantis egg cases in the um, uh, spring because unfortunately, most of the ones in our landscape are the invasive Chinese mantid. They've been documented feeding over 220 uh, species of birds, excuse me, like this hummingbird here. They displace our native mantid. So I go through the spring and remove them. I've got an article on my website I'm going to send you. Uh, this is the, the Chinese mantid. They're much larger. Um, they like to eat my pollinators. I don't like that. They don't belong here. Uh, and this is the native mantid here, much smaller. Um, and so it's good to be able to identify the egg cases. The native one looks like a loaf of bread and the uh, Chinese looks like a, a, a round edge cube. Very easy to tell the difference. Uh, here's some shots I took showing the interior and the hatching nymphs. And here's just an example. Uh, last year, I spent 30 minutes with my number two Felco pruners and I found 33 of them. Um, and we found over 75 of them total and we removed them. And this year we're seeing way fewer. I've only found one so far this year because of our efforts. Um, and so what do you do with them once you remove them? You gotta find a way to destroy them. Uh, once I saw this picture that a local birder took um, of a downy woodpecker feeding on a Chinese mantid egg case, I was like, yes. So then I, 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 I pinned them to my suet feeder on my bird feeding station, hoping to the, uh, attract the woodpeckers. I also tossed some into my friend's uh, chicken yard because <laughs> they liked them as well. So again, I'm hoping to post an article uh, with detail about these spring chores um, later. I'm finishing up. So resources, uh, pretty much everything um, I've mentioned is on my Growing Small Farms website. I'm gonna send you the link. I'm just mentioning it now with a URL in case people watch the recording and don't get the email. And we're gonna follow up with that email, but you're gonna find all kinds of information on my website. I'm gonna be posting the tour schedule soon. I've got lots and lots of fact sheets and thousands of photos and plant lists and things like that. And I'm gonna finish up with a final poll. If you will tell me what is your favorite pollinator, um, you're welcome to fill out the poll, but also if you have something else or just want to get more specific, we welcome you to write it into the chat. Um, and that's the end of it. I'm going to let y'all finish the poll and then um, and then I'll be glad to take questions as well. Uh, I hope I didn't, I have no idea how long I took. Um, so, so far, people are mostly liking the, um, the butterflies are winning out. Oh, nobody likes flies. Only one person. <laughs> Uh, but like I said, feel free to write some into the um, the chat if you want. Yep. Oh, gosh, the, the bees and butterflies are neck and neck. Who's going to come out ahead? We're literally 46 to 44 percent right now. OK, we'll just call it a tie between bees and butterflies. And I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and, and, and I can for, I don't know how long I took. If I went too long, we can wait for questions. However, you all want to do that.
Debbie, we've got about five minutes for questions. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So great job. Um, and folks, please put your questions into the question and answer box so your questions can get answered. Um, we have quite a few. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to spotlight you, Debbie. <laughs> so don't be surprised. <laughs> um, so first question we have is from Carol. Um, what is your fertilizer of choice for the pollinator garden? Oh, great question. My fertilizer of choice is no fertilizer. We use zero fertilizer in the pollinator garden. That surprises a lot of people. Um, literally, I've never used a single fertilizer. Um, the pollinator garden with these native perennials don't require it. Um, now I have added in 15 years, twice, I've added a, a very thin layer of compost under the mulch. That's it. You do not need, um, you do not need fertilizer in this type of garden. And as you can see, I hope from the photos, it thrives without them. Now, again, we've, we've worked hard on building up our soil. So that helps. Great, thank you. Um, next question is from Victor. Um, it's a little more specific, but when does the honeybee swarm season start in the Piedmont area? The honey, honeybee season, swarm season has pretty much, is already beginning. And it depends, it's very weather, you know, specific, but um, I work very closely with our beekeepers. We actually just finished an eight week beekeeping school and I'm pretty sure it's going to, I thought, I think I've already heard of some, but um, if not, it's going to be very, very soon. Yeah. Great. The uh, next question is also about bees from Christina. And they ask um, about native honeybees. Uh, maybe to clarify, I think you might have heard that we have no native honeybees. And can you explain why? Well, it's because honey, there's about seven species of honeybee in the world. And they're just, they're not native to the uh, North America. They're native to Europe and Asia. That, that's why. Um, so our native honeybee, if you will, is the bumblebee. That that's our other species that produces honey, but you know we don't we don't harvest that honey like we do. Um, they're not managed like they are um, honeybees. So it's just like saying, why do we not have tigers? Why do we not have native tigers in the U.S.? This is just not part of their range. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Um, I'm looking to treat my garden with nematodes for subterranean termites and Japanese beetles. Would that hurt my pollinators? Um, so that's an interesting question. So I have a lot of growers who use predatory nematodes. Um, you have to be, you have to have the right conditions for them to be effective because nematodes are, are aquatic species. They, they don't do well when the soil is really dry. They move with the water, the soil water profile. It's usually applied with some kind of irrigation system. Um, hmm, I've never been asked that question. I mean, you do have some ground nesting bees. I, you know, I, I think you'd obvious, I think it'd be obvious you wouldn't want to apply them. I've never heard of nematodes targeting, you know, bee larvae underground, but you also wouldn't apply them in any kind of nesting area, which is pretty visible where those are. Yeah. But I would say be careful, pick the, you got to pick the right species of nematodes for the right pest. That's a very crucial and have the right conditions. If it's if we're in a drought, I wouldn't waste my money applying them. Great, thank you. We have a ton of questions coming in. And again, folks, please use that Q&A box so we can keep track of them. And then perhaps as the next presentation is happening, Debbie might be able to type some answers into the boxes too. But we have enough time to answer, I think one or two more lives. So I'm just gonna scroll and see any common threads. Um, we did have some questions about the rock piles and then the mulching. Um, so about mulch um, is, let's see, is about, is the mulch the only thing you've done to improve the soil other than plants themselves? Um, that's a great question too. So we did use the no-till method when I planted and I was able to do that because the beds were already there. Like I didn't have to remove, remove sod or turf grass. And so I just basically sprinkled, I had these old, old beds with nothing in them with old mulch. So I, I spread a thin layer of compost and did not till up the entire bed, which, can, you know, preserve the soil. Um, but it, now if you're breaking ground on new, you know, lawn area, you would you couldn't do that. But yeah, other than not applying any pesticides ever, but that also helps the soil, which, you know, I can't cover everything in this talk. That's very important. You know, we're going to probably talk about that in a later webinar, but 
doesn't do any good to create a pollinator habitat if you're spraying pesticides, whether to your soil or your plants. Yeah, but mainly through the mulch um, and compost. Great. I did post a link to my website, but like I said, we'll be sending that to you later as well. Yeah, we'll be sending all these resources and the recording as well to everybody too. So that's all we have time for for live questions before moving on to our next presentation uh, with Mike. So Mike, if you could start sharing your screen whenever you're ready, that would be great. Sounds good. Well, uh, glad to be here, everybody. Right. And um, yeah, uh, that was great, Debbie. Uh, and you covered a few of the things I I'll mention, but you know, repetition is never a bad thing. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, caterpillars and their role in the landscape. And when she asked me to do this, I went, wait, wait, caterpillars in a pollination talk? Are, are you sure you want me to do this? But um, you'll see why. Uh, obviously, she mentioned, and boy, they came in second, it looks like, but butterflies, uh, Lepidoptera, are important pollinators, though not nearly as important as our native bees, um, for the reasons you heard, including um, that they lack the specialized structures for co collecting pollen, and they're bees specialize in pollen collection, whereas butterflies do a, a good job of going to uh, the same uh, species of flower in sequence. So that's helpful, obviously, for carrying pollen from one plant to another. Uh, and then you have the night shift of um, moths who often visit the same flowers, although there are some flowers that are primarily visited by moths. So, you know, all in all, butterflies and moths are important. And um, you know, I think I worked with schools all over the state when I worked with the Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh and uh, butterfly gardens was one of the things we did. And so they're very good uh, ambassadors for pollinators too. Uh, but my talk is perhaps gonna be about the pollinator precursors. You know, you wouldn't have the butterflies and moths if you didn't have the caterpillars. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. So let's uh, first set the stage. I'm gonna be just giving you a general overview of caterpillars here in North Carolina. Um, caterpillars are obviously uh, the larval or immature stage of a butterfly or moth. Um, and, you know, we have, uh, as Debbie said, 177 species of butterflies, and actually more species than I have uh, listed here of moths in the state. And you can tell by looking at these pictures that um, you really can't tell whether a caterpillar is going to grow into a butterfly or moth just by looking at it because, you know, they're all diverse. And, uh, but if somebody says, hey, is that a going to turn into a moth or a butterfly, just say moth, you, you have a good chance to, due to the numbers game. Um, so what makes a caterpillar a caterpillar? Well, um, you know, because there's a lot of things out there, a lot of larvae that confuse people. What is this going to be? Well, you can start looking closely at things like the head. Um, and turns out that most caterpillars have 12 eyes, six tiny eyes on each side of the head arranged in a, a C shape or a U shape. Um, they breathe uh, via spiracles, uh, usually uh, not quite this obvious uh, as on this imperial caterpillar, but along the sides of the abdomen, and they're kind of a, a slit with a valve opening, and it feeds into an open uh, uh, pipe system, basically. They don't have lungs, so it's just uh, diffusion. Um, and then the issue of legs. How many legs do caterpillars have? So if you look at this one, you go, wait a minute, uh, insects are only supposed to have six legs. Well, it turns out that caterpillars have three pairs of true legs up near the head. So they're a little tougher. They're used primarily, as you see in this photo, for uh, holding the food as the caterpillar is feeding on it. And then they, most species have five pairs of what are called prolegs. And they're kind of the fleshy appendages that help the caterpillar move and help it grasp onto a stem that rear one is often modified into what they call an anal clasper. Um, but this is why you don't ever grab a caterpillar and try to pull it off a plant because these can be torn and uh, that would uh, hurt your caterpillar for sure, if not kill it. Um, now there are exceptions as in uh, every realm of the natural world, uh, inchworms are one of those exceptions and you're familiar with the, the way they move across uh, the landscape, they only have two pairs of pro legs and that's why they have such an odd motion. And then uh, the other big exception are my favorite group of caterpillars, which often don't look like anything you'd call a caterpillar at all, the so-called slug caterpillars. Uh, here's a skiff moth caterpillar. And here's a view of one of the slug moths uh, that's crawling on a glass slide from, from below. And so they have no pro legs at all. They just move by gliding, uh, basically a ripple motion 
uh, along their abdominal side. Uh, now this group of critters is often confused with caterpillars um, and you can look at it though, and they often, many species do this defensive posture like this, so they're kind of noticeable. They have seven pairs of prolegs. So this is a sawfly larvae, which is not a caterpillar at all, but again, can be confusing. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, what's it like to be a caterpillar? What's, what's your life going to be like, a day in the life? Um, well, uh, they come from eggs, uh, the adults mate, and the female chooses a plant. Uh, some species, it's quite specific. Uh, only one type of plant will do. Others are generalists. Uh, so they lay the egg, and here's a monarch egg uh, with some scale there. Uh, that usually hatches in a few days. Uh, usually the first thing that the young caterpillar eats is its eggshell. So they're very good at recycling. Um, and then a caterpillar's life is pretty simple. It's uh, eat, 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 eat. It's poop, 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 uh, which by the way, your new word for the day is frass. Um, and then uh, that's caterpillar poop. Uh, oops, and we just had a problem here with advancing my, what happened? <laughs> Uh, I will take any advice, but suddenly it locked up. I have a weird thing that showed up on the... Well, what? Mike, if you have to, sometimes you might have to go back out and come back in. That occasionally happens to me. Oh, yeah. But okay. is it working? yeah, there's weird stripes appearing on my uh, program. But anyway, let's see if I can keep doing it this way. Uh, after all that eating and pooping, and you, you're going to grow... Um, I, I've suffered this problem. I, I go to the store and buy new clothes, but a, a, a caterpillar has to actually shed its skin or molt. Most of our common species do it five times. Are you all seeing these red stripes on, on your screen that are appearing on mine? Yes. Yeah, Dakota, is there any way to disable like the, what do you call it? That our participant is doing that? Uh, um, yes, it's from a participant. I'm working on that right now. Okay. I think okay. Colby or Jen, if you could help out as well, that'd be great. I'll Thanks. just keep going. Um, and here's a sequence of um, showing the hickory horn devil, one of my favorite caterpillars, uh, in, a, in a molt sequence. This is the getting to the final stage of the caterpillar. Usually they'll pause for a day or two without feeding or moving. You think maybe my caterpillar's dead, but in fact, um, they're growing a new skin underneath. They grow a head capsule underneath and you can kind of see um, there's kind of a bump right behind the head of this one. Well, then the skin uh, splits down the back and the new uh, version starts crawling out. Notice it's a little bit different colors than the old guy. And it may take a little while for it to come all the way out. It's a, an amazing process to, to watch. And uh, finally, they, they get out of it. Often that skin will fall off, but if it doesn't, uh, the caterpillar will usually turn around and eat it, which if you're a hickory horn devil, looks like quite a spiky affair to do, but uh, again, that recycling is really important. Uh, and then after about an hour, it changes color into the color that you would see if you look it up in a field guide. And this is a really important point if you're trying to identify caterpillars. You know, they usually get one picture uh, and it's the last stage before they pupate is the stage that's usually uh, put in a field guide. And the younger stages can look quite different. So uh, be aware of that. Um, but here's the glorious hickory horn devil, a green hot dog with spikes, as uh, Debbie said. Um, so oh, still not working. Okay. Uh, each uh, stage between molts is called an instar. And I'm going to run you through uh, the monarch development. Uh, so here's the one that comes out of the egg, first instar. And there's my thumb for size reference. Uh, the second instar, obviously, there's already been a color change. Um, and it's gotten a little bit bigger, uh, third in star, fourth, fifth. Most of our common species have five in stars. You see these are much larger now. The tentacles are longer. They're very different looking than the first. A lot of our common caterpillars uh, look pretty similar in the first, second, and sometimes even third in star, and then change, but it really varies uh, from species to species. At this stage, um, they soon will form what's called a pre-pupa. So that's the stage that they go into for about 24 hours usually. The monarchs make a nice J shape. A lot of other species hang straight down or attach themselves in some, some other way. 
Um, and they hang like this for 24 hours. And when I'm trying to photograph the process, um, when they start straightening out that J shape, that means they're getting ready to split open and the chrysalis will be uh, found. So they straighten out the skin, splits down the back again, and voila, inside, the, they wiggle around, that skin falls off, and there's the chrysalis. Or we call a pupa of a butterfly a chrysalis. It doesn't look like that initially. It's a little more elongate, but over the next 45 minutes to an hour, it assumes the shape that we're all familiar with. Uh, and monarchs are really nice because then in about you know 11 to 14 days later, the day before they emerge, the chrysalis turns clear and you can actually see the butterfly inside it. So you know, hey, get ready tomorrow, my butterfly is gonna come out. So it's a, it's a magical process if you've never witnessed it. Um, and monarchs are one of the nice ones that give you a warning of what they're getting ready to do. A lot of the uh, caterpillars, uh, I've raised a lot over the years for, for educational purposes and for fun. Um, they'll change color uh, right before they get ready to pupate. So here's an Eastern tiger swallowtail caterpillar on the left and what they normally look like in their last stage. And then they change, start changing color and they start crawling about. They leave the host plant and they wander for a while. So if you're raising them, you need to enclose them somehow. Otherwise, like me, uh, you'll have them pupating in very odd locations in your house, which is not good for you or the caterpillar. Um, but uh, color change is a, a common uh, occurrence. Here's another one, uh, Debbie's favorite, I think, the spice bush swallowtail, one of mine too. They're just incredible caterpillars with those great big fake eye spots that uh, help them mimic a snake. Uh, but when they get ready to pupate, they change color um, and they form a pre-pupa. All the swallowtails uh, form these silk loops um, and then attach their rear end with silk. And they look like a telephone repairman going up a pole. Uh, and then that will split and you'll end up with this chrysalis, which blends in very well uh, and looks kind of like a piece of broken twig. So again, the, camp, the, the pupa are often very hard to find. Um, and I, I always like to quote famous scientists. So here's one, George Carlin. Um, caterpillar does all the work. Don't we all feel like that sometimes? Um, a caterpillar's goal in life is pretty simple. Uh, oh, to be a caterpillar. Eat and not be eaten. Uh, it's a dangerous world out there if you're a caterpillar. Uh, and I'm only gonna talk about a few of the things that prey upon them. Uh, wasps and bees are major predators of uh, caterpillars, not necessarily for themselves, but to feed their larvae. So this is a good tie-in also to the pollinator uh, theme in that a lot of our uh, predatory wasps, um, here's a common thread-wasted wasp who has stung this caterpillar in a particular location to paralyze it, but not kill it, and has already dug a burrow and is dragging this caterpillar to the burrow, will stuff it in the hole, lay an egg on it, and then cover it back up. And when that egg hatches, it will feed on this caterpillar. So, um, you know, it has an indirect tie into pollinators in, in that sense. Uh, here's another one, the uh, four-toothed mason wasp who is gathering pollen and nectar, uh, but who uh, will also paralyze uh, caterpillars and put them in a, a cavity. And then, the potter wasp that uh, Debbie showed earlier, here's a close-up picture of one, uh, and they make these beautiful little mud nests and then stuff them with small caterpillars. Uh, I broke one open once and there were uh, eight little uh, inchworms in there and then lay an egg and there's food for the babies when they hatch. And of course, uh, one of the key reasons that uh, I think land managers might be interested in caterpillars is that they're so important in the diets of songbirds. Uh, most songbirds uh, rely on caterpillars, uh, other insects, and spiders uh, to feed their young, even if as an adult they feed on other things. And the reasons are you know, great because caterpillars are these soft-bodied, protein-rich, easy, easily digestible packets of food that are found everywhere. So it's, it's a great thing. Uh, I was asked by Doug Tallamy, uh, or somebody who was working with Doug Tallamy years ago to film uh, some chickadees at a nest site. Uh, for a program he was doing. So while I was standing there filming, um, this was a hollow log nest box that I built so it would look natural. Um, and the chickadees were bringing in their food and I watched them for a considerable period of time. Uh, but in one hour, they brought in six caterpillars 
They actually brought in more spiders uh, that time than they did caterpillars. But in the 17 days that they were um, feeding their young, that would have equated to about 1,200 caterpillars. So obviously, caterpillars are incredibly important for uh, the beneficial uh, benefits of songbirds. And Talamese research has shown that um, places that have more native plants produce more caterpillars, uh, and then that produces more songbird success. But you know, it's uh, not just all these bees and wasps that eat them and feed them to their young. There's a more insidious threat out there if you're a caterpillar, and that's the parasitoids that uh, Debbie mentioned. And here's a parasitoid wasp about the size of a gnat inserting its ovipositor in, through a spiracle on this small caterpillar, laying its eggs inside. And what happens then is the larvae of that parasitoid wasp hatch in the caterpillar and feed on, a, one biologist put it, non-essential tissues. I'm not sure what non-essential tissues are, but they feed on it and in such a way as the caterpillar is still alive and crawling around feeding. And I don't know that it's been parasitized unless I look real close and might see a dark spot sometimes where the eggs were inserted. But then one day the alien movie comes to life and these things start popping out of the body. Um, and here, the, so these are the larvae and you can see they've already started spinning their silken cocoons. And you may be more familiar with the end result. Here's a, a, a hornworm with baconid wasp cocoons on it. They look like Q-tips that have been glued to the back. Um, and at this stage, the damage has been done. The wasps larvae have fed on the caterpillar. It may still be alive and they formed their cocoons and are getting ready to hatch. But shortly after this, that caterpillar is toast and it won't make it. Tomato growers love Bacconid wasps uh, because that helps their tomato plants. I gathered this particular spiny oak slug to photograph and actually share in an educational program. And the very next day to my dismay, um, the guys popped out and formed their cocoons on it. And I kept them in a jar and this is what came out. That's pencil lead there for scale. So as Debbie mentioned, there's so many minute things out there that we don't know a lot about that are, but that are so important in the functioning of the system. Uh, here's another one that I wasn't even sure what these were on the side of this caterpillar. It turns out they're uh, eulophid wasps, uh, tombstone wasps they're called because they basically desecrate the uh, caterpillar and they crawl just an inch or so away, form their pupae, which look like little tombstones or uh, macabre uh, rocking chairs, perhaps, with little piles of rocks, which I think are the waste products from the last stage of the larvae. Very bizarre stuff. This was on the underside of a sycamore leaf. So um, let's talk about defenses, though, because uh, obviously caterpillars managed to survive this gauntlet of predators. Um, there are many ways uh, they survive. One, like a monarch, you can eat things that make you taste bad. Uh, the glycosides in milkweed are distasteful to particularly bird predators. Um, you can get physical. Uh, this prominent has these two tail-like extensions and when a small parasitoid wasp flies by, they whip them around like whips and they have glands, those orange protuberances at the tips are glands that emit a, a mild acid. Doesn't bother us, but apparently is, uh, distasteful or perhaps even harmful to small flies that are trying to pick on it. This is one of my favorites, the Harris's three spot. And remember I mentioned that when caterpillars molt, they shed their head capsule and their skin. Well, this is the only species I know of that keeps its old head capsules on strands up above its current head and then uses them as a club. So when a little fly or wasp is trying to lay an egg on it, it swings that around and beats them with its old head capsules. Uh, quite a unique uh, defensive strategy. Be a stinger. This is one of the most effective in keeping us humans from touching one of the caterpillars. Luckily, it's only, you know, 12 or 15 species that are found in North Carolina that have these urticating spines. This is a close-up. And uh, if you were to touch or uh, brush up against one of the these spine tips, it breaks off and in doing so injects some venom. They have venom sacs. Uh, into your skin. And it uh, feels, most of them feel like a mild bee sting, um, you know, wasp sting. And I've actually intentionally touched myself with uh, this species, the most common saddleback, just to show a group of uh, teachers I was working with, it's not going to kill you. Yeah, it does hurt a little bit and it leaves a welt. And everybody's 
you know, uh, difference in their sensitivity. So I don't recommend doing this at home, uh, but I would have a little welt that would last for, you know, 20 minutes or so, and the sting would last only a couple of minutes. Again, mild wasp sting for most. A lot of them are, have almost no sting that I can feel. The crown slug, one of the most bizarre looking ones and beautiful. Here's another bizarro, the monkey slug which is uh, said to mimic a tarantula as a defense mechanism. And then the one you definitely don't want to get stung by. I have never uh, had the misfortune of uh, being stung by one of these, but the puss moth, which ironically looks like something you'd want to pet, um, but uh, it has some powerful toxins in its venom. And I have had two friends that have accidentally been stung by one um, and they both went to the emergency room because they were concerned the pain lasted so long and it was so intense. Now, the good news is um, we really have to search for these to find them. They feed on a variety of trees. And unlike a lot of caterpillars that feed on tree leaves who come down to the ground to pupate, these guys pupate up in the tree itself. So uh, most people have never seen one of these, uh, but don't touch one if you do. Um, another way uh, some caterpillars defend themselves is to make themselves look like something else with fake eyes, make them look like a little snake, for instance. So this is a uh, tiger swallowtail, eastern tiger swallowtail. They also, uh, the swallowtail gang has another defense me mechanism, chemical warfare. If you mess with them a little bit, they extrude this Y-shaped gland, which might help with the snake mimicry, but it also uh, has a mild acid in it that is uh, Distasteful, I am told, to uh, vertebrate predators and smells really bad. Um, so it's called an osmaterium. And, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt us, but you definitely notice the smell if you're driving around with some of these in the front seat of your car to take to a school and they get bumpy and, and start spreading that, you, you'll notice. Um, you can hang out with a lot of your friends that are all distasteful. And this group of caterpillars the detainers, uh, they have bad stuff that comes out of both ends. And so when a predator gets near, they make that C shape. And so no matter what you touch, you're going to get a mouthful of bad stuff. Um, you can look like something that nobody wants to eat, uh, mainly bird poop. Uh, a lot of caterpillars, especially in their early instars, are bird poop mimics. Um, this particular species, the red spotted purple, looks like bird poop all the way through its chrysalis. So uh, again, supposedly an effective strategy against birds, at least. You can blend into whatever you're feeding on. Uh, twig mimics have this amazing ability when they get disturbed, they just do this and pose in a rigid pose that looks like a broken off twig or stem. Uh, or you can eat part of the leaf and then blend in with that section that you ate. And I tell you, it's some of these caterpillars are really remarkable in the uh, detail in their, their patterning and coloration that matches damaged leaf tissue. So they can be quite difficult to find. Uh, the loopers, the camouflage loopers are one of my favorites in their effort to decorate themselves to look like the plant that they're feeding on. They have spines along their uh, dorsal side and they'll clip off pieces of the plant they're feeding on, feeding on and stick it to their back to blend in. Uh, at night, if you go out and look, you'll often see a lot of the inchworms in particular hanging off the leaf by a silken thread. And that is to protect them from predators like spiders that might be patrolling the leaf surfaces at night looking for a meal. Uh, and then a lot of caterpillars fold the leaf. And I think Debbie mentioned that uh, you know, they do that by stringing silk across it. And as the silk dries, it contracts and eventually that pulls the leaf together. And this was a black locust. And if you gently pry that open, uh, you'll find this silver spotted skipper who also has fake eye spots to kind of spook you when you first look in there. Um, and they will come out at night and feed on some leaves adjacent to this shelter. Uh, and they also have another interesting characteristic and you don't get to talk about this very often in polite public, but since it's a group of uh, scientists here or, or scientists that, uh, people that want to learn from scientists, um, these guys exhibit something called projectile defecation. Um, so turns out wasps and some parasitoids cue in and find their caterpillars by the chemicals emitted from frass. 
So to avoid that, if you live in a shelter, you wanna get rid of the frass. These guys back up to the opening and they have a, a, a hydraulic pump near their anus that allows them to flick their frass uh, up to many, like 30 body lengths. And I like it that somebody studied that and discovered that. So, um, so if you're interested in caterpillars and want to kind of make sure you promote the diversity and abundance of them, um, you can do a few things. Uh, plant a diversity of native plants. Uh, so this is my front yard. Um, I, I don't have the sunlight that Debbie gets in her pollinator garden, so I definitely am jealous of that. But, uh, and also don't use pesticides. Yeah, just as she said, you don't want to, you know, kill the very thing you're trying to attract by using pesticides indiscriminately. And then the other thing is preserve the native plant habitats. Um, and I think my understanding is a lot of you all are land managers. And so preserving uh, particularly habitats that have a lot of uh, plant diversity is, is really important for maintaining caterpillar diversity. Um, and Talamy's studies uh, have shown, and he did some studies in suburban yards that had native plants versus mainly non-native plants. And he found that native plants typically had 35 times more caterpillar biomass than the non-natives. And, and chickadees, he studied chickadees, and they set up their nest sites uh, more frequently in those yards that had the native plants and produced more uh, fledglings uh, than those chickadees that did it in the non-native yards. So it's an interesting study, very valuable study to promote native plants. Another thing you can do to help uh, caterpillars uh, is just to learn about the local species you have and, and what they feed on, what host plants. And uh, this is one of the resources that you'll be getting uh, in that from us, uh, just the, the list of some valuable references. This is the Caterpillar Bible, the Caterpillars of Eastern North America by David Wagner. And there was just an article published in the New Yorker magazine about this man who is passionate about caterpillars and is now working on a volume for the uh, Western North America. Um, there's two great, uh, well, this website is particularly good for all sorts of insects and spiders, bugguide.net. And uh, they have thousands upon thousands of images. Um, and you can search by, you know, if you have any idea what the family is or roughly what it looks like, or you can actually submit a photo and they'll identify it for you. Um, this young man, Sam Jaffe, uh, is in New England and has created this nonprofit called the Caterpillar Lab. And it's remarkable what they're doing up there. And he will be publishing books soon, I think. He takes amazing images of all life stages. And that's one of the real benefits of what he's doing. He has photographs from egg uh, all the way through the caterpillar stage and then the adults and pupa. So it's, it's gonna be really beneficial, but he has great websites, great videos, uh, wonderful educational material, and just some cool caterpillar uh, uh, information and even t-shirts, you know, whatever you want, caterpillars, you can get it from Sam. Um, and then two apps that I highly recommend, um, LEPS and SEEK, they're both free, uh, and they both work uh, by just pointing your camera on your phone at something, and then it will try to identify it for you. So it's a wonderful resource uh, for helping you identify weird things out in the field. Not just, and, and SEEK is not just, uh, you know, butterflies and moths and caterpillars. It's all sorts of things, plants, animals, birds, everything. LEPS is butterflies and moths and their caterpillars. Um, so here's my uh, poll question. Uh, you know, we're talking about plants uh, that caterpillars feed on called host plants. And that's kind of, you know, Debbie mentioned that she's done a lot of plantings uh, uh, in her pollinator garden that are more host plants than, than maybe nectar plants. So here's a, a list on uh, which of these groups do you think produces the greatest number of different caterpillar species? Asters, hollies, maples, milkweeds, or oaks? Which of these do you think is the most important in terms of producing uh, or feeding the greatest variety of caterpillars? So I, I, I'm looking, we'll, we'll continue on here for a second and then get the final poll results. Um, milkweeds, uh, of course, monarchs are uh, critically important uh, to 
you know, the milkweeds are critically important to monarchs and that that's the only group of plants they feed on. Uh, so that's a really important species to have to help our dwindling population of monarchs. Uh, Spicebush and sassafras are the host plants for uh, Debbie and I's uh, favorite, uh, one of our favorite caterpillars, the spicebush swallowtail. Um, wild cherry is a host to a whole variety of uh, caterpillars, including the red spotted purple, the one you saw earlier, the bird poop mimic. Um, tulip poplar, my property has is dominated by tulip poplars, um, but also things like sweet bay magnolias and some of the other magnolias are host plant for uh, eastern tiger swallowtails. And so I have a lot of them flying around every year. Um, and then sweet gum, the much maligned sweet gum, a lot of the schools that I worked with, the teachers didn't like sweet gum because it makes those spiky balls, you know. Uh, but when they found out that it's the primary host plant for luna moths, that tended to change their mind because I don't know too many people that don't love luna moths. And then uh, sycamore is a good one for a lot of things, including this puppy dog mimic, the uh, banded or tussock moth. Uh, they both look at, uh, identical, so it's really hard to identify them. So uh, which species, let's go ahead and answer our poll question, which species or which group of plants, I should say, uh, provides food for the greatest variety of caterpillars? Well, it looks like you all are right on it. 57% of you said oaks, and indeed, Talamu's research has so shown that oaks support more types of caterpillars than any other genus of plants in North America. Close to 900 species of caterpillars feed on oaks of various sorts. So excellent job on your uh, poll question. All right, and uh, a few other species to, um, there we go, that are valuable that I always look for when I'm searching for caterpillars. By the way, one of the reasons I'm so in love with caterpillars is years ago when I worked at the museum and they started Bug Fest, I started the caterpillar booth. And so now every year for however many years, 20 some years, we've been collecting caterpillars the week before Bug Fest and showcasing some of the amazing diversity of native caterpillars here to our region. So it's always been a lot of fun. That's where I got a lot of these pictures, taking them on um, bugs I collected at Bug Fest. Okay, oops, where'd it go? There it is. Um, so if you want to find caterpillars, there's a few tricks. Um, you know, they blend in pretty well. Uh, you can look for chewed leaves. Uh, that's always a clue. Uh, you might find beetles and other things. Katie did that chew those leaves, but look for chewed leaves. Uh, look for that frass. And believe it or not, um, I often um, walk down like a woodland path or especially a country road that's dirt. And you can look down on the ground, and find frass, and you look up, try to find the caterpillar that made it, the frass maker. Uh, if you know the host plants, you can look for eggs and young caterpillars on that. But I find that my best hunting is done at night. You'll need to warn your neighbors so they don't call a sheriff. I have been checked by the sheriff once here in Chatham County, but uh, looking with a flashlight reveals them a little better. And if you really want to get good, and this was told to me by the guy at the Caterpillar Lab, use a UV flashlight at night because a lot of our common species glow under UV light, which makes them a lot easier to find, especially those slug caterpillars, which blend in so well that they glow at night so I can see them from 10 feet away. Um, so my main message is uh, caterpillars are incredible. Their life stories are amazing. They turn into beautiful moths and butterflies. And uh, I encourage you to get out and look for them and enjoy some of their beauty and diversity and try to you know, help maintain that in, in your properties, okay? So, uh, and this is a very valuable lesson, I think. Uh, that I always used to leave with the teachers at schools. Teaching a child not to step on a caterpillar is as valuable to the child as it is to the caterpillar. So, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mike. That was a great presentation. Um, we're about a couple minutes left in today's uh, webinar. We will be staying on a little bit extra for folks that have more questions. There are a couple of announcements I wanted to make before people need to hop off. So I'm gonna share my screen just one more time. Great. We have a couple more save the dates for Forest Her events coming up. 
On May 4th, we're going to have a really exciting workshop opportunity um, to talk about prescribed fire and prescribed burning. We're going to have a learn and burn in the Sand Hills region with the Sand Hills Prescribed Burn Association. Registration for that just opened today at noon. Um, on July 27th and October 26th are save the dates for parts two and three of our pollinator series. And then we will have a few other in-person workshop opportunities this year. We're not quite set on the dates yet, so definitely sign up for our email list or stay tuned on our website or on social media um, to find those dates. And yeah, just connect with us on our website, join our Facebook group. You can just search Forest Her and See on Facebook and to join that group. And we have social media accounts as well. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and then open up again for questions. Dakota, and thanks everybody. I, mention, I know we have a, um, we're gonna be hosting a Forest Her in-person, uh, workshop on August 24th here in Chatham County. So content, cool. content yeah. is determined, but you could mark, at least mark your calendar if you wanted to. Awesome. Okay, great. I wasn't sure that was save the date was ready, but August 24th, that is definitely a very important date to save. And I will send that in an email along with all the resources as well from today. All right. Um, more questions, questions. Here we go. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Tony, it looks like. I started a pollinator garden two years ago, planting primarily to attract butterflies, in particular monarchs. I know it has been said to leave the aphids, which I did. However, the aphids totally destroyed all the different varieties that I had planted. The plants actually looked like they had been torched. I'll be surprised for the plants return this year. Any suggestions? I mean, I, I I don't know what he means by torch. So there are many different feeders of milkweed, including the two leaf beetles. So I'm assuming he's correctly identified the culprit. I, I have have had high aphid infestations and have never had them kill plants. Um, some years, I will say some years are worse than others for aphid, for the oleander aphids on milkweeds. And uh, sometimes it can be, uh, maybe he means torch. I bet I know what he means because they, um, once the aphids feed on the leaves and they secrete honeydew, you can get sooty mold forming on the leaves. And yes, so that's like a black covering. It can actually interfere with uh, photosynthesis for the plant. Again, I've never heard of it killing a plant. Uh, I'll tell you what I do sometimes. In the years when it's, first of all, I've learned not to put um, common milkweed too close to the edges because it can be unsightly looking. Um, but um, what I do when, like, I think last year it happened when it was just really bad year for that. So what I did when it was actually had sooty mold covering not only the leaves, but the blooms, which would interfere with pollinators visiting the blooms, I cut them to the ground. And so what that does is it makes them, um, re, you know, re-sprout. And then you hope, uh, and often that you get a much better luck that second round. That's actually a practice I do anyway, uh, when I have time. Um, there's been research showing that uh, monarch, later season monarch caterpillars prefer feeding on newer growth versus the, the tough leaves of, of, you know, of milkweed. So when my milkweeds have done blooming, I'll often cut them to the ground in like mid-July. And when they re-sprout, they offer that more tender leaf to the later generations of monarch. So if he's got a really bad case of that sooty mold, he might try cutting them to the ground and let them re-sprout and hope for the best. I don't know if Mike wants to add anything to that. I mean, yeah, I have them all the time, but I have enough syrphid flies and other uh, you know, predators, uh, mm -hmm. lady beetles, that they uh, don't take over. I've When I worked at the botanical garden for a while, we would sometimes just take our fingers and, you know, Rub up against them, squish them. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would not spray anything, yeah. whether insecticidal soap, even. Um, some people will just direct a hose, a lot, lot, you know, high volume spray, but I just don't even really want to do that. Um, you know, if you, if you really are intent on removing them, like Mike said, I would just use my fingers. It's kind of gross, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I just ignore them. I've never had a plant killed by aphids, uh, you know. Great, thank you. 
And we have one more in the Q&A box. So if anyone else has questions in the Q&A box, please type them in now. Um, and we're also at the time where we can open it up if folks would be more comfortable and would rather um, say their question live, we can do that too. Um, first, this question from Eileen. Um, she asks, I've heard that the transition between chrysalis and butterfly is not really understood. Is that true? Yeah, it's um, it's an amazing thing. You know, a lot of people think, oh, it turns to soup in there. And um, they've done, they're doing more um, work with x-ray type technology to see what's going on inside. Uh, they do know that uh, groups of cells called imaginal discs uh, are in that late stage and cr cluster together and certain imaginal discs will, will form the wings. Certain ones will form the mouth parts. So there are clusters of cells gathering um, that have the function of you know, changing into the adult parts, but it's a, it's a, it's a magical thing really. And mm -hmm. to witness it is, is really special to just see that process. You know, we can't see the inner workings, but to see the process. I agree. And, and there's, you know, so I think someone had asked about how to prevent, you know, caterpillars from disappearing. You know, the fact is that most butterfly eggs never make it to adulthood. There's a lot of things that want to kill them. And there's, a, there's some mysterious things that attack the pupae, the chrysalids. And I'll never forget. I don't know if I ever showed Mike this picture. I was going to try to find it real quick. It would take too long. To this day, I don't know what caused the problem. I had a, a monarch chrysalis and it had like a perfect rectangular window cut into it and it was dead. And yeah. I showed it to many butterfly experts. They said, I have no idea. I've seen stink bugs, you know, feeding on them. But to have something, something cut, a perfect little rectangular window is the most bizarre. It's on my Facebook page, but yeah. there are many mysteries that we just will never know, you know. Great. Thanks, Debbie. All right. We have come to the time where folks, I'm going to switch the view again to gallery view so I can see everyone's faces. And if anyone has a question that they'd like to unmute themselves for, we have some time. Um, if, if anyone has any more questions for our wonderful speakers today, you can raise your hand, either like actually raise your hand or there's the raising hand reaction option as well. Um, if neither of those work for you. Also feel free to just unmute and speak up. You know, there's been a lot of comments in the chat box, both Debbie and Mike saying wonderful presentation and wonderful information. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely agree. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk, Mike. <laughs> I love the rock pile idea. That's a, you know, I have them here and, uh, but showing how to make them with, that was a great tip. Well, I think my favorite photo was your close up of the caterpillar butt with the frass. Got to give you points for that, man. Oh yes. <laughs> that was a first for me. Give me an idea. <laughs> um, we did have a question come in the chat box. Yeah, from Chuck asking, are all oaks good hosts? Yeah. I, I you know, some are better than others, uh, of course. Some of the ones that have really thick waxy coatings probably aren't as palatable to as wide a variety, but i tell you, um, you know, Talamy lives, I think, up in New England or Pennsylvania, maybe. And he recorded 500 and some species of caterpillars on the oaks on his property. I mean, that's remarkable. Um, so uh, I always look at oaks when I'm looking for bug fest caterpillars uh, and always find something. So it's ironic. A lot of the stuff I find for bug fest are feeding on trees. Um, you know, obviously some of the uh, herbaceous stuff, is, a lot of it is actually host too, but um, tends to be for smaller caterpillars. You know, some milkweed being an exception where you get monarchs, but uh, an awful lot of the big caterpillars that are, you know, the sexy caterpillars are uh, 
found on trees and all this, uh, most of the slugs, slug caterpillars are. So I spend a lot of time looking up. <laughs> Someone asked question. about rock piles. I would put them in full sun. Yeah, Debbie, I have uh, two water gardens at, with rock retaining walls around them, and I had bumblebees nesting in one of them last year. So oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah, if they come back, you must call me, Mike. Okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't, so rock, rock, um, what's the word? Not rock piles, rock retaining walls yeah yeah those are the other way you can do it you can build a wall and so yeah i didn't mention it because i had only so much time but yeah, yeah i gotta come to your house <laughs> y'all know how i met mike i just remembered yeah. years and years and years ago what you called me out because you you were wanted you, you had a, a pest that you didn't know what it was or i can't remember no you knew what it was i don't know i, don't know. I came out to look at kudzu bugs at your property oh right 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 yeah yeah that's how we met about bugs yep Fit pretty fitting. <laughs> yeah, sounds very fitting. I think Jennifer Welsh, I heard you unmute for a second. Do you have a question? Yeah, it's about bats. I have uh, bat houses up. I put it up about five years ago and no bats. How, what am I supposed to do to attract them? Um, you know, the a lot of people are using the, the pole uh, type to, with houses on all sides. So a lot of the bat houses that have been promoted um, like through uh, the Texas groups um, aren't as effective on our species, but um, there is, there's a lot of research going on here. Um, I have them behind the, I've got something, a decorative art thing hanging on the wall next to my front door and there's a bat that roosts behind there. Um, so I don't know, I think you, Go online and um, Deb, do you know of any particular groups in North Carolina that she could turn to? I can, if she contacts me, I can, I've, we did a bat program a few years ago. I can look it up. But um, I, I, one thing I'll share is sometimes things take years to be discovered. True. And That's so right. that take, whether it's a rock pile or a ground nesting bee habitat that you created, I've learned patience. You know, you want to make sure it's at the appropriate height because they have to drop. Um, and then I know another one of our forest her members, I think it was Fallon, <laughs> recently posted that she had bats nesting uh, behind her window shutters. Yeah, <laughs> They're not necessarily picky, but um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. All right. Do we have any other questions? or comments for our lovely speakers today. Yeah, right. someone, somebody was saying in the chat that they put bat houses, it took a few years before they were inhabited. So yeah, as long, I would just double check to make sure they're in the right exposure and height and then, you know, be patient. Yeah, and I think the it's called a rocket box. I think the, the design that I've seen is pretty effective in the Southeast US. So it's a pole with things on all four sides of it. All right, well, I think that's all of our questions for today. So thanks again, Debbie and Mike, and thanks everyone else for joining us and for sticking around. Um, I know we dropped some links in the chat, but again, we'll send out um, all of the resources and recording and links and all the great stuff to everyone that attended today, as well as folks that registered and did not attend. Um, we'll, we'll get you covered, don't worry. But So thanks again, Debbie, Mike, it was great to see you and thanks. I'll see you all later. All right. Bye everybody, thank you for attending. Yep.